So here it is. It's bad. It's scary. The basic fundamental push dagger. Knives like these, edge weapons like these, just run throughout history. Just about any culture with an edge weapon that you go to, you're going to find some sort of push dagger that looks something like this and is carried in some further way in this manner. I've seen them on the end of handguns through history, flint locks, etc. And so historically, they're a very popular and successful weapon. What I want you to consider, though, when you use this, when you do the things that we're about to show you, legal issues. You know, use, as our moniker says, you know, use only that force necessary to do what it is that you need to do, and sometimes force is necessary. So this is ugly to juries. This is ugly to cops and people when they will be considering the actions that you take. And so just be very much aware that uh, using any edge weapon, but certainly ugly, more ugly ones, built not for campfires, helping an electrician, but weapons that are designed to kill and maim and stuff, don't go well. Even when you're completely justified, there's usually some, some flack. And so I want you to check your laws. You might not be able to carry this in many places, around the world, certainly, but here in the United States. Check the laws and take a real good uh, uh, study of the use of force, uh, not just for police, but for citizens, and uh, decide, do you want one, and should I use it, and where? Who, what, when, where, how, and why? One of the issues many people bring up with push daggers is sort of the natural delivery or angle of the fist, the positioning of the knuckles. And as you can see, when you hold this type of weapon, it is uh, not quite at the knuckle in comparison to a knuckle punch. And it, it exists a little bit more in the middle of the upper part of the finger. So some people fret and worry about that and they, they dismiss the push dagger because of that reason. And I just don't. You know, if it's going to be off, it's going to be off. It's the same thing with brass knuckles. They rest not quite on the knuckle, but lower on the finger. So uh, they... Uh, belittle that, but if you've ever been hit with brass knuckles, you wouldn't belittle it that much. Uh, one of the issues, too, about this is the when you select these is the distance between the finger and the blade itself. That has something to play. It may cause the, the knife to shift in your hand. It's also important as the inside of the grip, where it is, uh, where it fits, and will it roll. Other people worry about throwing the hook punch and also jacking this up. Two. So you can see that position with the knuckles is always is going to be an issue. Um, two major positions here. We have the, the karate style, the top two knuckles. Some push dagger experts and people like to punch using that alignment of the top two knuckles in karate. Other people uh, are quite content, as I am, with the middle of the hand. Not worrying about those two knuckles so much because the perfect alignment's not there as it is in punching. But I seem to have a better grip on the whole thing by using the middle of the fist. To explain further how some of these knives are made, here's an example of one that really emphasizes the top two karate knuckle type punch. So you can, here's a, here's a sheath for it, goes on your belt, can go anywhere. I'm not here to sell any of these knives, I'm just trying to here to give you some ideas have an assortment of uh, fist-held weapons. And you know, when I define the word fist, you basically hold every web, every knife in a fist. But when you're stabbing, it's not the configuration of a fist. And this is just really about using mostly a push dagger in some sort of fist grip. Uh, there are other weapons that uh, operate this way. And of course, we, we'd like to discuss weapons where the edge of the knife comes out on the top of the fist or on the bottom of the fist. Now this is reasonable in slashing and stabbing, but here's the angle issue to me that I'd like for you all to think about. When I'm eating a steak, when mankind, since cavemen, eat steaks, what sort of shaped knife are they going to use? And what, therefore, are we so used to? And so when you have a knife with an unusual angle to it, and this is not as unusual as some of these claws, uh, you don't want to eat a steak with a knife like this. That's kind of my own personal test, you know. 
is uh, I look at the edge, I see how curved it is, and if it's too curved, it becomes impractical to me and also requires extra training that I'm too lazy to do. So I don't want to do all that extra stuff. Um, you see these, for example, and I just picked these up. Uh, this particular carpet or linoleum knife is uh, three ninety nine in a store that I got it. You know, and it's not eighty nine bucks or something else. This one is a little bit bigger, and uh, it is it was nine ninety nine. And probably in real life, and in my ca me working cases in the past, this is the stuff that people attack you with. And I do not want to be attacked by this knife or any other curved knife. They're, they can all kill you, but just in practicality purposes. But uh, something, even in the Philippines, folks, they're probably going to be using tools to kill you that they uh, function with regularly. Now, the point that I'm just trying to bring up is about the point, is that these knives are about cutting rugs and cutting linoleum with that point. And the rest of the edge doesn't seem to play as much as a regular, simple knife, a regular steak knife or a regular uh, tactical knife, which can do so much more uh, survival material, and whereas something like this can. So these are always low on my, my list. And the subject of karambit, you know, they seem to all have this ring at the end, which does uh, help you keep the weapon, and that's a fine thing. I've even seen people call straight knives karambits because they had a ring on the end. That's technically not correct. <clears throat> but the ring on the end and flipping it around and stuff is just something, you know, I'm not interested in doing. It's just unnecessary, requires more training and more work. This curve, uh, they talk about manipulating and shoving arms around. When someone's fighting you, moving their arm is about 170 times harder than it is in training where you just moving people's arms. So I don't want to be attacked by this at all, but at the same time, I'm quite unimpressed with it in compar comparison to regular other straight knives. Can I eat a steak with it is my question. So one more point about this too is the claw, the hook knife, is a lot of people do a lot of motion with it and they're swinging away, but in reality, when you, and this is not as drastic a hook as some of these that I've seen. Um, you uh, hit someone on, upon contact and that hook may get stuck in the body, stuck in the clothing possibly or the bones or whatever. So all this freestyle slashing motion, funk, gets stuck in a person. Then you've got to learn a new trick to get your hook out of the bone or the person. If you want to do this, that's, that's fine. It's just not for me. For a real, real close up look, here is our classic shaped push dagger. And then look at the comparison and size and shape to other items such as the scissors, for example. Now that's what I wanted to bring into it, your attention. Now take a look at these scissors. These are my road travel scissors. I go to many countries where I can't have anything at all. And in my room, I usually get these handy. Uh, they fit, they're suit very strong, and they fit inside my palm so well that I use these uh, uh, as a last minute self defense plan, all for the slashing and stabbing. Now, you just can't use any pair of scissors. Here's look at the differences in size of these, and you can see that the handles are bigger. These and other scissors don't fit in my fist as well as this one does. So you can see where a simple pair of scissors can be used as a uh, push dagger weapon. In some lethal targets, we have our classic lethal attacks. Uh, you've got uh, uh, the commandos referring to the skull as the honeycomb. You have the entry through the eyeball that hopefully, remember this is not as big as a traditional knife or some of the knives you might carry, so traveling up into the, into the good part of the brain may be uh, challenging, you know. But you have a big hole here, you have a big hole that's here, you've got these nostril holes that can get in deep and do something. Uh, lethal wise, some people talk about going through the skull, that's always difficult and challenging. A lot of times it skips and goes around through the scalp. 
They talk about the temple. A good hard shot to the temple may produce that brain entry if it's possible. And of course, this width is not conducive to an ear entry necessarily. But the old commandos would like to come into the ear if they could. D discussing the throat, of course, we have the slash of the, this and the stab of this uh, anywhere here on the throat. And uh, you won't probably have that long blade problem of it getting jammed up in the backbone. We also have access to the heart. Fundamentally, the equation is you attack the heart through the rib cage, from below the rib cage, or above the rib cage. But you can see the, the, the general structure of the ribs that you have to worry about and where the sternum is, where the heart is located, not up here, but you know, more down here. And will, based on the size of the person, will this style knife get into that spot? And how will it enter, penetrate, and so forth of the rib cage? And you have all the major bloodlines that you need to attack. Hopefully, you know where those are. Uh, you also have that armpit destruction area, the pelvis destruction area, all the main bloodlines, major stabs in those. And of course, we know forensic specialists always tell us that, that stabbing produces more fatalities. But of course, slashing can too. And as you will see, we have tremendous slash capability with this. But you hit those main bloodlines with a good deep slash. Remember, you're fighting the person uh, almost all, both ways. You're fighting them till they pass out. Should your push dagger get stuck inside the bone of someone? And there are, there's actually a few stories where knives have been stuck by, by suction in other parts of the body. But I think you, you could overcome that much more easily than if you got stuck in the bone. Here's a shoulder blade. Shoulder blades come in various shapes and sizes. Take a look at any one of my books. You can see they're different thicknesses like people are different shapes and sizes. But uh, they're the old school way, whether you have a, a push dagger of some sort or a regular knife is, if it goes in, they, the three ways, you twist it on the way in, you twist it while it's in, you twist it on the way out. Well, that's all one big motion. So you can twist the blade you twist at the wrist, at the you know, wrist and um, elbow, and then the wrist, the whole thing right up to the shoulder. Should be able to crank this out for you, should it get stuck in there. And they will get stuck, and sometimes deeper than you can handle with what we're, what we're just talking about. So that is a solution when you do try to stab and you get stuck in some bone. Here's some quick training devices for you. You know, this of course is, uh, you could get this through metal, metal detectors if you care to. These are really not a training device. You can get them that are dull, but these are pretty hard to work out with. Um, and so substitute for that, that's why I brought it up here, is here's a complete foam one that you can cut out of. Uh, I think the big dog Kerwood in Mississippi cut this out of a like an old, uh, like, uh, martial arts school mat of some kind. This is very good to train with. Still a problem in the eyeball at the end, but they're very soft. And then I, put, I use these too, which is nothing but like a PVC T pipe with some uh, cut off rubber so that I, I can teach a group of students uh, more safely this material. Consider what I like to refer to as 10 positions. As you know, by now, I'm not a big fan of worrying about uh, uh, fighting stances. And so you have one, you fight, you respond from these 10 positions. The first one is that non-ready position, and that is, of course, the classic, comes all the way back from Ed Parker Kempo Karate, is the bus stop stance, where you're just in your own hypnotic world, thinking, waiting for a bus or whatever it is. And so we make everybody fight from that position. Suddenly pull a weapon, strike, kick from the, from the stupid stance. And then after you do the first move, then you get in some ready position. So the first one is a non-ready position. And the following nine are what uh, we'll show you right here. So we have, however you want to hold this particular knife, 
Uh, you have three standing. That's knife forward, knife neutral, and then knife back. If uh, uh, you disarm a person or fighting an unarmed person, knife back is pretty smart. You can use this arm to protect yourself, to grab, to, to strike, etc. Uh, if he has a knife, knife back to me is not very smart. If he has any caveman fighting ability, he'll just destroy this limb. Your thumb will hit the ground, your finger will hit the deck, he'll start bleeding. So I'm not a proponent of this in an armed confrontation, but still, no matter what, you will be moving through these three positions in any kind of fight. You have knife forward, knife neutral, and knife back. So now, the next three are knee-high positions. This knee could be up, the other knee could be up, the two knees could be down, it doesn't really matter. We are fighting people who are over us. We are fighting people to, who are equal to us in this knee-high position. For whatever reason that is, he could have fallen with me, etc. And then we are fighting people who are under us. This is essentially the top side of a ground knife fight. You can post with the fist, you can post with the hand, you might post with the forearm, post with the elbow, you might even have to post with the shoulder in the chaos of all these moves. But these are the three knee high positions. And then we have the last set of three, which is on your back on the ground. You can fight someone in this full range of problem right here. You know, you lean over to the left side, you fight someone on the left side, not just right here, but really where this picks up from the being on your back, anywhere right here. And then you fight people from the right side, not just right here, but from this area right here. So these are the big nine ready positions, universal to all our courses. Everybody learns from the beginning. Basic training is the 12 corners of the clock. And advanced training is all the numbers of the clock. And so these are tools in your classes that you can accentuate more stuff, you know. Oftentimes I just demonstrate with the basics and hope that everyone in the classes will throw in the advanced version of the clock. By using the clock, you solve many, many problems, uh, training problems, too many to, to talk about here but it's footwork and positioning and everything. So here we have, just for the demonstration purposes, we have a 12 o'clock, a 1 o'clock stab, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. And that's how you can use the clock, um, right and left-handed, in all the ready positions. We're going to take a look at the thrust and the hook. Remember the four ways the arm attacks you? In a thrusting motion, in a hooking motion. A, a hook is anything other than a thrust, even if it's subtle. And you have the committed lunge uh, that stays out too long, and the hit and retract that is probably the tactical smarter thing to do. So the arm attacks you in those four ways. In our solo command and mastery, we try to do at least a thrust and at least a hook. In terms of the thrust, you have two different fists as you do in fighting. You know, the human fist attacks you only four ways. It's a vertical fist, a 45, could also be that way, a horizontal, and then an uppercut. And so curiously, the saber stab, uh, the angle of the blade is delivered in those same ways. You have a, a vertical blade, a 45 blade, a horizontal blade, <clears throat> or an uppercut look. And these transfer over from a, a saber grip out of the top of your hand down into the top two knuckle or to the middle knuckle. We always have solo command and mastery. That's you working out by yourself or on a heavy bag or whatever piece of equipment. When we talk about knives, I want you to have that war post that you can stab. Working with edge weapons on a war, wooden war post is one of the biggest influences of my training. It's pretty important to do. It's hitting something really hard and then having it stick, you know. Anyway, so the first thing we're going to take a look at is the fist stab. As you know, I'm a big guy uh, of the combat clock. I think we can do everything this way. And so how am I going to stand uh, like Mohammed Ali might stand with a push dagger in his hand? But I'm going to punch at 12 o'clock vertical fist, 
punch at 3 o'clock with a vertical fist, punch at 6 o'clock with a vertical fist, punch at 9 o'clock with a vertical fist. We must do left and right hands. You have 12, 3, 6, and 9. Why I bother emphasizing the vertical fist is with the push dagger, you have the option of the horizontal fist. You punch 12 o'clock or anything that's high from the axis on up. You punch 3 o'clock, anything from the axis out. Here's a 6 o'clock shot, anything from the axis down low. And here's that 9 o'clock shot, anything from the axis out this way. Then we switch hands. We have a high and to the right and low and to the left. Any knuckle position that you want to do. You should, in a class, check people's synergy for this. Make sure they're just not standing here and just doing this. They have to have an athletic uh, appearance and some sort of synergistic look. So that's what we count on for solo commanded mastery. Try to keep track of that. Have a, a demonstrator up front and you walk around and make sure these people have the overall athletic approach to doing this. But for the record, we, all, we will go through all nine. We won't go through all nine on every one of these. If I am knee high, I, I hit an attacker that's at 12 o'clock, horizontal or vertical fist. I have a high opponent, I hit at the 3 o'clock side, a high opponent at the 6 o'clock, high opponent at 9 o'clock. Yes, the other hand, you know. And you can switch knees if you want to. You can switch knees while you're doing this. I keep going, you know, invent stuff as you go. <clears throat> now, You've done the left side. Now we're looking at someone who's equal height to us. We have a 12 o'clock, a 3 o'clock, a 6 o'clock, and a 9 o'clock. Switch hands. 12 and 3, 6 o'clock, and then 9 o'clock. And then we have the person who's under us in some way. You can post if you want to. It doesn't really matter. You have a, a thrusting kind of punch at 12. Thrusting punch at 3 o'clock side. Thr thrusting that's low. And a thrust on this side. Then we're on our back. We have a thrust at 12. If you want to in your classes, make them do the vertical fist, make them do the horizontal fist. There is, of course, as we'll demonstrate in a second, the 45 degree angle. But you have a high punch, a 3, a 6 o'clock, and a 9 o'clock. Switch hands, 12, 3, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. On the ground when we stab, I always ask people to try to do some sort of a range moving sit up. And so I sit up and stab at 12 and come down. Sit up, stab at 3 and come down. Sit up, stab at 6 and come down. Sit up, stab at 9 o'clock and come down. Same thing on the other side. We have a 12, you've got a 3, you have a 6 o'clock, and then you have a 9 o'clock. Knife back in the right hand. We'll lean over to uh, you know, the left side. We have a 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 9 o'clock. Uh, all sorts of combat is about being in awkward positions. Shooting, sticks, knives, etc. The left hand side is compressed. It's difficult, but we still get a 12. We still get a 3. We still get a 6 o'clock. We still have a 9 o'clock. Then we'll switch over to the right hand and lay over to the right side. We have a 12, a 3, a 6, and a 9. We'll switch. We have a 12, a 3, a 6 o'clock, and then a 9 o'clock. One version of our thrusting stab or hooking stab I'd like you to add on as a possibility, whether it be the vertical fist or the horizontal fist, as it comes out, shake it up. 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, shake it up. 6 o'clock, stab it, shake it up. 9 o'clock, stab it and shake it up. This creates more injury. And also you have to think about, too, that if something goes in to someone's arm, they pull back, and they're doing that work for you, destroying muscle, destroying tissue. Uh, very likely they will pull back, and then the shake them up job, they've done half of it for you. But just consider not just the stab in and out, but if, you, if it's appropriate, stab, shake it up. Stab it, shake it up. Stab it, shake it up. Stab it, and shake up the knife. As far as hooks are concerned, uh, athletic position. How would Muhammad Ali stand if he had a push dagger in his hand? Think about basketball, soccer, football, those types of uh, 
ready positions. And so we are going to have a hook stab from above at 12 o'clock, a hooking stab from 3 o'clock or anything on the right side, a hook that comes up from 6 o'clock, and a hook that comes in from 9 o'clock. This, of course, starts to resemble a back fist, but you have to really accentuate those knuckles. You remember the old school back fist is this postage stamp area of knuckles strikes here. You really have to position that knife to get that hook. Right-handed and left-handed, the hook from above, the hook from the right side, the hook from below, and the hook from the nine o'clock side. We have to discuss the slash. Where the push dagger is effective in a punching environment, the slash is most effective in a hammer fist environment. We're trying to catch out here, you know. And so we have just the, uh, the whole uh, slash uh, momentum and module. We're standing here. We have a 12 o'clock slash or anything from above. We have a 3 o'clock slash on basic training or anything from the right side. You have a 6 o'clock slash that comes up and a 9 o'clock slash that comes anything from the left side. You also have double slashes. Uh, there's, when you double slash with a stick or a knife, there's really two fundamental ways. Same line, if you deviate from that line, it starts to look like an X in some wide or narrow fashion. So all double slashes are either same line or looking like an, an X pattern. But you have 12 o'clock and then back. You have the 3 o'clock back from 9 o'clock. You have 6 o'clock then back from 12 and then 9 o'clock to 3 and then back again. If you deviate from that line, well, let's just say from 3 o'clock, you know, you, you come across at 3 and decide that to, when you're at 9 o'clock that 10 is the best way to follow. There's the X that we're talking about. Let's take a look at some combinations real quick. Use the clock you haven't made. Here's a 12 o'clock thrust, you know, punch with a follow-up slash. Here's a 3 o'clock stab and a follow-up slash. Here's a 6 o'clock stab and any follow-up slash. Here's a 9 o'clock stab and any follow-up slash. Stab first, then slash, you know, through that whole continuum, right, left, the nine positions. Then you also have a slash first and any stab from 12. Any slash, any stab from the right side. A slash from 6 o'clock and then any stab, and then a slash from the 9 o'clock side and then any stab for combination. More combinations to think about. Stab, any hand strike. Stab, any hand strike. 6 o'clock stab, any hand strike. 9 o'clock stab, and any hook or thrusting hand strike. Punch, stab. Punch with three, any stab. You see the combinations that you can work. And then you have, of course, that you can start with a slash or a stab. You can slash, stab, and any kick. Slash, stab, and any kick. Slash, stab, and then any kick. And then for your guys, the best thing is to put them all together eventually. Any strike, any stab, any kick, any slash, any number that you want. But then it becomes, you know, a way to build some shadow boxing. One more thing I usually add as, uh, to a lot of this program is to something that I thought of years ago, uh, nicknamed uh, chain of command drill, uh, thinking of a big giant heavy chain in front of you and trying to stab inside the links of these chains. It's an elevation drill, basically. And fundamentally, like so much of the push dagger material, is like bare knuckle boxing. And so you have, of course, the, the jab, the cross, the hook, the uppercut, and you step forward and you have a descending overhand. Then you're in this lead for this jab, this cross, this hook, this uppercut, and the descending overhand. And this has been around the martial arts for, as far as I'm concerned, 
when I first learned it was in the 1980s. And basically, you, you just get better at those five things. Uh, you spend your whole life getting better at those five things, let's say if you're a boxer. But then I just started to wonder, what if I put a knife in the hand of this drill? And if you leave boxing and punch illegal targets, you need these other elevations. And so this is why I'm just going to show this here, and I'll slightly angle this. Now, if uh, you could do this with two knives and kind of cover ground, or you, when you switch leads, you're going to cover both sides anyway. But you have that jab, you have that cross, you have this hook. Make sure all your people have the proper body dynamic when they're doing these things. Don't overdo it. Just do it to the point of efficiency. And then you have this uppercut. You step off and you have the descending overhand, which has become popular again. It kind of disappeared for a while, but it's become popular again. So now I'm in this lead. So that knife gets to jab, cross, hook, uppercut, step off, and a descending overhand. So that's the big, simple, basic one. But let's just talk about these three elevations. And I'll do it with a knife in my hand. Really, from that jab position, you have a high target, a middle height target to punch low, and a low target, which is illegal in sports, but it's the old karate groin or lower intestine shot, and so of course that stab down there. So you have three elevations in each one of these. You have high, medium, and low. I'll just put this in the cross hand to save time. You have a high cross, you have a medium target cross, and then a low target cross. I'll put this knife back in here for the hook. You have a high hook target, a medium hook target, and any low hooking target. Put this back here for the uppercut. You have the high target, which could be under the chin or somewhere around the throat. A medium target, maybe somewhere under the rib cage. And then a low target, the groin and the lower intestines. Then we'll switch back to here for the descending overhand. I step off. You descend with a high target, a medium height target, and a low target. And that's what I call, you know, this chain of command drill. And it's in our books. You can see it's certainly in the knife book. Imagine a big, thick naval yard chain and the three, four, five links that are in front of you here that relate. And you're just hitting a high, you're stabbing inside the high link, stabbing inside the middle, and stabbing inside the low. And by doing these three elevations, I think it just adds more depth to your training. He's got that soft push dagger that I showed you uh, so that it doesn't destroy your equipment. And look at all the different equipment pieces you can use here. This square one, this classic round one, you have a tie pad. You can use all of these. Just remember to uh, uh, do it responsibly. You know, essentially that's, he's working off that dot. And all these gear, these pads and stuff may have the manufacturer's name in the, in the center. Uh, Hide the dot as for as long as possible. If you leave it out, you're supposed to hit it multiple times. But if you if you're going to feed feed it and don't confuse them, you know, with unprofessional feeding. And so here I am. He's just going to feed. The faster you pull the knife away, see he didn't have contact that time. He'll get pissed. He'll be faster the next time that he that he missed that. Here's a hook to here. Here's a hook to here. There's, a, there's an elevation drill that you might use, and, and we'll just go through it slowly. I feed him maybe just four targets. It doesn't really matter. He knows it's a three elevation drill, so what I'm going to do is kick him in the knee and he falls down. And then I feed him from here, and he has to do it this way. And then I kick him in the knee and he lands on the ground, and then I give him the same sort of feeds. It's a three elevation drill with a focus mitt. For the slash, he, this takes a little work. We'll just do the slash without this, the stab in a second. I give him this, and I find that the push dagger is so short that he has to work to get a slash across the stick. You listen for the sound. And so it's tough to develop for the person to get in close enough to make that contact. So it's important to get that slashing skill in there. And so then you have the various combinations, slash and stab. Stab and any slash. Slash and stab. And you mix it up, of course. After he knows you, you take a kick at him. You know, you just do stuff. 
then you can enter this into the three elevation drill. You have the high, and he slashes. You kick him. He lands on his knee. Stab, slash, stab, slash, stab, and slash. You kick him again. He lands down. Stab, slash, stab, and slash. So we'll now take a look at another great training tool, the statue drill, where he just stands with his two fists up. Something I, I took from Wing Chun, you know. And this acclimates people to the target acquisition. It, it acclimates them to placing their weapon and putting it on a person. And it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's beneficial, I think. It gives them lots of, of ideas. And so, uh, the, technically speaking, yeah, you deal with problems here, 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 here, and then here. That's the full spectrum. We've talked about this before. However, I often don't do the split and just do outside, inside, inside, outside. And so <clears throat> here we have the slash. Uh, we're going to slash the forearm outside, inside, inside, and outside. Now, you know, I picked up from the Philippines uh, a three-slash method where uh, they seem to worry about slashing the forearm, slashing the upper arm, slashing the throat. So you can next assign them biceps cut, bicep slash, bicep slash, bicep slash, and then you can assign them throat outside, throat inside, throat inside, and throat outside. Positioning, target acquisition, you got to get it in your head. The statue drill is a great way to do it. Then you also have stabbing these three targets. Four, you might be out here, and if you don't stab the forearm in training, it doesn't become part of your uh, repertoire. And if you never see the curveball, you'll never hit the curveball. So we have a forearm stab, forearm stab, forearm stab, forearm stab. Working up, bicep stab. I'm stabbing the bicep because I can't stab closer. It's there, I'm getting it. And you have throat stab. Oh, that's a good one. Throat stab, throat stab, and on the outside, throat stab. These are uh, great ways to acclimate yourself to this. Do it left-handed and um, right-handed. And get a student used to touching a body with the weapon in these critical spots. Out of, out of fashion for numerous years in edge weapons, and now back in fashion, is an armpit stab and I have this real knife here so I'm not going to do much with it it's the coal steel model but um, this is a very tender place to shove a knife up it gets some major blood vessels and if you will add some shake to it uh, it can really destroy use of the limb but also be a very grievous injury and so it's back it's popular now this armpit <clears throat> that is a, a, a pretty bad disabling attack here. We always, we always show the vertical fist blast in uh, any time we are thrusting motion, certainly with a knife. He punches at me, I palm. I backhand, but I'm using the, the uh, push dagger for the, for the contact. And yes, you know what they do when they're cool. Let me just use this one for a second. When they make that contact, they don't just, oh, they want to get a cut in there. So just something to think about when you're making that contact. But here we have a, a, a palm, a backhand knife, a palm, and he does basically these same three things. And this is a classic under many, many names. A vertical fist blast, a horizontal blast, you know, many, many different names. But it, it is nothing but a palm, a backhand essentially contacting with the knife, the palm goes on the elbow to control the arm without any hesitation, no drawback, this goes forward. And then he does this to me. Since his hand is still moving this out of the way, here comes his knife at my face. I have no choice but to palm, backhand, palm. <clears throat> palm, backhand, palm. A classical person uh, would uh, not use the backhand, but use that. Because we worry about the withdrawal, which could cut these blood vessels. And so you'll see often this serving here 
and like that. And then faster guys just do that. Here's a version of the statue drill that you can use to sort of uh, prime the pump uh, for that ver vertical uh, fist uh, blast drill. You have palm, backhand, palm, stab. This set works over here. Palm, backhand, palm, stab. So you see that pattern's here, that pattern is here. Then if you want to try to do the other side, you have to uh, alter it a bit. Palm, backhand, palm, stab. And that works over here. Palm, backhand, palm, and stab. And that works this side and then this side. Let's take a look at now some applications. So before we do the full-blown uh, countering a punch and kick attack, here's a, a skill, a warm-up drill that you can use, you know. And so I, he's got that soft knife, and he's taking shots at me, swinging at me, trying to cut everything that comes in. And then you could come in to do some finishing stab or move or takedown. three common carry sites for your push dagger, whatever type of one it is, is uh, primary carry site, think quick draw. That's usually the belt line, the pockets. Secondary carry site, think backup, which is very typical for a push dagger in a sheath under here. Very popular place. Up the pants, down to the boots. Secondary carry site, think backup, quick draws. And then tertiary is uh, lunge and reach somewhere around the person, around the car, etc. So he's got to worry about that, but you have to worry about getting your weapon out. You might turn your body sideways to pull it out. Um, you may threaten with this. And as you know, you can take a look at some of these. You know, the good thing about a silver knife is it's very visible and quite threatening. You know? And uh, with the right command presence and the right verbal commands, uh, could stop the fight. Statistically, year after year, the Department of Justice says it's about 67, 70 percent of the time you pull a gun or a knife, sticks not included in the, in the study, the criminal leaves. It'll be an ugly situation. It won't be that simple usually, but yet you shut down the attack. And so stress quick draws as we do like mad in level one of the knife course, standing and on the ground, work on it, you know, the same thing, you'll be pulling your push dagger out into position. Um, and so one of the quick ones, you know, he gives you that push once, he gives you that push twice, I, I, I have a stress draw, and I might say, get out of here, get back, or whatever you decide to say. Many law enforcement people or otherwise will carry a knife that resembles this. This goes inside your pants, inside your police belt. There are sort of catches here to keep it there. And under stress, you pull this out. And this is an, a, a, an acceptable way. Uh, they carry it in different positions, but it's a stress quick draw. You might say, if it's a visible one in your pistol belt, it's a primary carry site. If it's under stuff, it's a secondary carry site. So we have a problem here where uh, our hero is, is grabbed from behind with this sort of bad choke of some type. And so what I'm, I realize the problem, hey, you know, you got to try to uh, save your bloodline, save your wind as best as possible. Hopefully, there's nothing harder to get out of than a good choke if he's got you. And he could wrap this up pretty bad, and, I, and I'm in trouble. But if this knife is quick accessible, I can take it out. The big mistake, which is why I want to bring this, is people have a propensity to stab the arm that's choking you. Now, if he's moving me around, oh, oh, I could stab myself very easily. And so what I'd like to suggest that you do is take this out and stab him in the thigh. I'm getting him in the groin really well. Usually, they will release the grip. You can get out 
and, and continue to do whatever you need to do till it's over. So work on escaping stand-up chokes by the, the pull and the action with the, with the uh, push dagger. One of the popular places to carry the folding knife even is what we used to just call the pelvis carry, but now newer young guys in the rat race for cool names have called it the appendix carry. I guess in about 10 or so years it'll be called like, you know, east of naval carry or something like that. But at any rate, this is a stress quick draw like a belt pull that we talked about. And you can see how it could be handy for you. It is accessible in both right and left hands. And if he does get me in this worst choke, now keep in mind, you know what he could do. That's a grapevine. There's the X catch. But I still have a second to get in here and get this. And just a second. Because if it's bad, it's not good. And you know, he could arch himself and roll to the side. But just as an example, if I can get this out, I'm going to attack and punch these thighs, hopefully until I can break loose and his hands are get loose and then try to get up and then finish it in some way. Okay. Very, very common state laws around the United States of America are beginning to identify the difference between a blood choke and a wind choke. A wind choke is more because you could damage the windpipe. And so this is, there's 150 different things to do here, you know. Get a couple of favorites, but today is push dagger day. And so he's got me and I'm going to reach, I decide due to the circumstances, the situation, I'm not gonna clock him. I may, he may be 10 times, he may be Brock Lesnar. I might not get out of this. I could beat Brock Lesnar all day long and nothing would happen. I pull, I pull out this dagger and look at the potential targets. Huh? If you don't want to kill him, that's why we earlier did these bicep stabs so that you have that in your muscle memory and of course, you know, hit and move. Um, he, if, if we stick this in, it's possible he may retract doing more damage as he does so. This is just knife basic any kind of knife stuff you know so he's got you here I pulled out that knife from that quick draw spot maybe even from under here and you can go lethal or less than lethal the leg sweep outer inner inner outer leg sweep this is just a classic and almost everyone I know, know something about it. It's just fundamentally a trip. You trip them down to the rear. And uh, lately, some newer organizations don't know this leg takedown, and I'm kind of surprised. But at any rate, we are, whatever that encounter was, and it's a dead, it's, this turns out to be justifiably a legal force encounter, that goes right into the throat. Boom. And then, I'm going to get myself, I may have to do this, I may have to do this, but I'm just going to go ahead and do the sweep. This raises up deep down into his clavicle <laughs> notch for a push down. I step and drive even further. He's in rough shape. If you've penetrated here and driven it down into here, he's going to be in pretty rough shape. So this is a simple takedown with the push dagger application to it. one, uh, just as a demonstration, because people land here all the time. It is not my favorite position, but you have to be familiar with it because people land here all the time in this little uh, uh, roughed up simple uh, trip almost. He hits the ground, you hit the ground, and you're in this, this scarf hold. Now there are, when one system I was in, uh, 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 shoot fighting, numerous locks and tricks from the top side, numerous you study from the bottom side. But this is the knife world, you know, he's the hero. And I, I take this, you have this catch here, this is a classic one right there, and then they just start beating the snot out of you with a base. 
But in, in sports, he can't put his finger in my eye and stuff like that. But it's so bad for him, he's pulling out his knife from his belt line as, a, as he's taking, and he begins to cut his way and stab his way out of the scarfold. So keep exploring grappling, standing it on the ground with acquiring in a stress quick draw and using the push dagger. The push dagger versus the stick. Man. First of all, you have to go through, we have unarmed versus the stick and a series and a training progression to learn from there. And uh, you hope that the stick attacker is an ignorant thug who takes big Babe Ruth swings at you that you survive or he misses, you know. But if he comes in, you've got if you're in stick range, ow, it's terrible, you know. So you have to be out of stick range or you have to be in to try to catch his over chambering on both sides. He's got an impact weapon now. See, that was a throat cut, and that's another cut there and an arm hook. So you have to play with this. Just play with it, have a guy attack you with a stick, draw out your training dagger, and just see what's there for you and get used to it. I'm telling you that if you just practice that freestyle for about 30 minutes, 35 minutes, make a commitment, 45 minutes, you will become savvy about doing this. And so just mix it up. Get in there as fast as you can. Maybe wear some stuff and mix it up. So now we have the push dagger versus the handgun, which of course is horrible. But we use, this, we use it in terms of uh, uh, the subject matter, in terms of uh, interrupting quick draws and um, like that. The gun is out, it's kind of too late for the knife, more or less, unless he turns away to get somebody else and you can pull it and slash his weapon bearing limb or something. But um, what I really want to discuss real briefly here is the fascination of using the uh, dagger uh, for pistol retention. And many people carry the knife in their police belt or their belt for that specific reason. And at, at one time I had a giant uh, module of using the tactical folder for handgun retention. And then my friend, who's a very smart gun guy and cop up in New England, Ralph Moroz, uh, cornered me and said, you know, you don't really need that knife. And plus, how many times have you seen people stabbed and slashed multiple times with no effect at all? This is a good point. And so we just started, we started working out. Uh, he hosted me for a seminar up there. We started doing some stuff, and he convinced me that here's your tactical folder right here. Always opens. You'll never drop it. And anytime anybody goes for your gun and, and he's got a grab of it in some way, open up your tactical folder and destroy his vision. You won't drop this, and you have lots of experience opening this under stress. And so go for that, and it really is quite an effective thing. Maul that face, stick your fingers in it as deeply as possible in his eyes. It's a lethal force situation. We know statistically, certainly police officers who lose their pistols are shot with their own gun. We don't have statistics on this in terms of citizens, but there's a parallel. You should be scared when the bad guy beats the snot out of you and takes your gun. That's another thing, too. A lot of times they just don't go for your gun. They're whooping on you in the process. We have another pistol retention video I'd like for you to see with strategies involved with that. But uh, I just ask you to think about this. Now, I know there have been some successful pistol retention counters done with police by pulling out their knives. It's happened, uh, but it's risky to me. And maybe the thumb about this far into the eyeball would have been just as an effective tool and easier to, to do than being punched, dropping your knife when you're trying to open it, accessing your knife, all those other steps. So I just want you to think about it, substituting your fingers for the folder under uh, pistol retention times.